Welcome to Arts Express. This is Prairie Miller and on the show. First, we'll begin the show with a poem, a true poem. Hi, I'm Lloyd Schwartz. I'm going to read my poem, A True Poem. A True Poem. I'm working on a poem that's so true, I can't show it to anyone. I could never show it to anyone. Because it says exactly what I think, and what I think scares me. Sometimes it pleases me. Usually it brings misery. And this poem says exactly what I think. What I think of myself. What I think of my friends. What I think about my lover. Exactly. Parts of it might please them. Some of it might scare them. Some of it might bring misery. And I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to hurt anybody. I want everyone to love me. Still, I keep working on it. Why? Why do I keep working on it? Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever see it. I keep working on it even though I can never show it to anybody. I keep working on it even though someone might get hurt. Thank you. And thank you, Lloyd Schwartz and the Academy of American Poets. And next up on Arts Express... Tony told the old man to tell me to tell you. Mm. It's what it is. What it is? It's what it is. They wouldn't dare. (laughs) They wouldn't dare. Please, Frank, come on. Don't say they wouldn't dare. No, don't, don't tell me that, Kenneth. That's, that's fairy tale. Please, don't say they wouldn't dare. They're saying this is it and then it's it. Jimmy, I'm trying to tell you something. I know you are. You're telling me they're threatening me, and I got to do what they say, which is but it's more absolute. Than a threat. It's the bottom line. Bottom line. It's it's what it is. This could happen to you. They could come after you. Azov Battalion, that is said to be Nazi-affiliated organization operating as a militia in your country, uh, said to be committing their own atrocities. Azov was one of those many battalions. They are what they are. Hold on a second. Did Ukrainian President Zelensky's evasive reply to anchor Brett Baer's Fox News question on air about the country's neo-Nazi Azov battalion wing of the military, apparently, and their war crimes, they are what they are, sound an awful lot like Robert De Niro's mob assassin warning to Al Pacino in The Irishman. Or just coincidence. Mulling that question in our cancel culture, uncancelled corporate media watch episode this week is Pentagon and NSA operative turned activist Karen Kwiatkowski speaking to RT as this provocative reply uncovered here by Zelensky has been wiped clean and disappeared from Fox channels and online. A frank admission from the Ukrainian president about the far-right Azov battalion, pressed by a Fox News anchor, Vladimir Zelensky, acknowledges that the severity of the atrocities that they are accused of. Azov Battalion, that is said to be Nazi-affiliated organization operating as a militia in your country, uh, said to be committing their own atrocities. Azov was one of those many battalions. They are what they are. 
This fragment of the interview was later deleted from all Fox News online resources. Karen Kutovsky, a retired U.S. Air Force lieutenant colonel, told us why President Zelensky will find it hard to hold the battalion to account. Publicly, Zelensky is saying that he wishes, he hopes to hold uh, them accountable for any, uh, if it's proven or, or as we get more information, he intends to hold them accountable. But unfortunately, the track record that he has, his, his uh, uh, political situation is such that um, it's highly unlikely that he will be able to hold them accountable. They're part of his political support structure. Um, not to say that he agrees with them all the time, but he is dependent in uh, some ways uh, with with their agenda. He's dependent on their agenda to some extent. So um, it's not like he can simply just get rid of them. I mean, as he said, they are integrated into the military. Um, there was a reason they were integrated into the military and not rejected from it. Uh, certainly, Americans are anti-Nazi. They don't want to hear, uh, and, and the government doesn't want them to hear, that uh, we are in effect, aligning with Nazis. And we don't want to ask too many questions because we aligned with them in 2014 and we've aligned with them since 1940 in many ways. The CIA has a long history uh, that's well reported and well acknowledged of working with um, uh, Nazis in Europe, in particular Ukrainian Nazi group. Ukraine is getting wrecked. Uh, it's getting wrecked because the United States uh, wishes to sacrifice it for to the altar of uh, anti-Russian propaganda and preservation of the of the dollar as the world's reserve currency. I mean, this is so much larger, I think, than Ukraine. If it doesn't fit into uh, the unipolar maintenance of the United States as a unipolar power, the top dog on the planet, if it doesn't relate to that in an anti-Russian way, we really, they, we're not interested in it. The United States uh, media is not interested in anything but supporting uh, the U.S. agenda, which is really not caring about Ukraine at all, or the Ukrainian people, or the Ukrainian agriculture, or the Ukrainian resources. This is really about um, U.S. versus, uh, in particular, Russia, and then, in a larger sense, Russia's allies. And now on Arts Express. Hi! <laughs> then we've got company! Welcome, Sex Pistol. Your mum says you're a nice boy. Any comments? <laughs> Who the hell do you think you are? Sex Pistol. This is my girlfriend, Nancy. <laughs> You like me, don't you? This is more than a mere bass player. He's a fabulous disaster. Sid Vicious is the sex pistols. I couldn't live without you. I'm your best friend. were scenes from Sid and Nancy, the 1986 Alex Cox-directed Sex Pistols Punk Rock Noir, starring Gary Oldman as Sid Vicious and David Heyman as Sex Pistols manager and musician Malcolm McLaren. That punk innovator and self-styled outrageous and unconventional anarchist credited with the creation of the Sex Pistols. Phoning him from Glasgow, Scotland, Heyman whose huge body of work has also included Riley Ace of Spades, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, Hope and Glory, Queen and Country, and The Tailor of Panama, will also talk about his latest film, the gangster thriller Bull, commenting on violence today and off-screen in connection with a different horror in the current war crisis and economic ramifications around him right now over in Europe and his upcoming films having to do with a young Edgar Allan Poe 
and Hitler and Chess in Brazil. Hi and welcome. Now one film that stands out early in your career is Sid and Nancy about Sid Vicious and the Sex Pistols. What drew you to that story? Well, to be asked to play Mal- Malcolm McLaren, who is <laughs> extraordinarily wonderful and complex and challenging human being, who could say no, uh, Brady? It was, uh, it was, it, you know, just just a great challenge and great fun to do. And I, I wanted to work with with Alex Cox and a great cast, a fantastic cast in Sid and Nancy. Gosh, I haven't thought of that movie for a long time. Mm. Yeah. Well, but I think it came across as a really powerful anti-drug statement. Because, mm. um, you know, you're broken-hearted for them when they, when they end up dead. Yeah. And how would you describe what Bull is all about without giving too much away? Uh, I think it's a very exciting, visceral, violent ride. It's a, a family revenge tragedy. Uh where the characters are driven by love and loyalty to each other or disloyalty to each other. Um, it doesn't let off. It, uh, yeah. It's a gripping 90 minutes. Mm. It starts off at a certain pace and just takes you on through. The soundtrack is terrific the way it's shot. We didn't have much money to make it. Um, and shooting it during the pandemic is was tricky. But I know we're all really proud of the end product. Mm. Great example of that low-budget... British gangster mm. movie that come out of that, that whole kind of genre that goes way back to Get Carter and beyond. What is it about Bull that got you on board as the ruthless crime boss Norm, who ironically, whether intentional or not, is not at all normal like his name would suggest? <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, pray, he's a warm, loving, gentle family man. He just fell into <laughs> the wrong crowd. <laughs> Uh, um, what drew me to it? Well, instantly the script. I just, I, mean, I love Paul Andrew Williams' work anyway. Uh, and then he sent me the script. And I only got it a few days before filming because I replaced someone. Uh, and it was, I just responded to it immediately. It had such, such passion, such grit, such integrity. I thought it pushed the envelope. I thought it challenged. It challenges your morality, how you, how you react to that level of violence, uh, that level of intensity. Um, Neil Masco is a, I mean, that's a no-brainer. He's an extraordinary powerhouse of an actor. It was a joy to work with him. And a great, a great a supporting cast. Um, so it was, it was a no-brainer to say yes. And we had a great time doing it. It was a tricky movie because we didn't have much money. We were one of the first movies uh, during COVID, during the lockdown, to go into production. Uh, so we had to be very mindful of all of that and our own personal and public safety. But... Uh, yeah, I'm really proud of the end result. It doesn't let you off. <laughs> and if you were doing a psychological profile on Bull, how would you describe him and what his problem is with other people and with the world? Well, look at the family he's attached to. <laughs> are, they, are, are they much better? Is my character much better? I mean, he's a sociopath, he's a psychopath. Violence is a means for him to express himself, to let out that inner rage that is driven by the betrayal of his family and the fact that he's attempting to save his son. It's about a love affair between a father and a son, a grandfather and a grandson. Um, at the end of it all, this love that drives them, however much, however differently they express that love um, and that sense of loyalty to, to family. And what do you think it is about violent thrillers that fascinates in an enduring appeal to mass consciousness today? Oh, good Lord, pretty. <laughs> If I had the answer to that one, honey, I don't know. I guess it's, I mean, let me answer it this way. I get attracted to playing parts like that. I, I get attracted to characters on the dark side, characters who, who are very limited in means to, to express, except through, through violence or power or control or corruption. Um, maybe we just like to see our dark sides expressed. I think all human beings are capable of wonderful acts of, love and kindness and understanding and compassion and these same human beings in a different circumstance are equally capable of the extreme acts of violence and revenge and brutality and just uh, prejudice so it's you know that, that it's that extraordinary mix that dichotomy of the human race and would you say violence is more graphic and gory in british movies and if so why and do you think it's become more graphic lately 
think there's always been that in British movies. There's a period when, when you you guys in America, you went to I felt it was very sanitized um, violence. You see someone shot, and you don't see the repercussions of it. You don't see mm. how brutal that wound looks. You don't see right. the devastation of a human body. Um, I guess there's always been that always been that element, but it is it's getting well, movies are getting more graphic, aren't they? Yeah. In many ways, television is getting more graphic. And what drew you to your current projects? What about your upcoming Raven's Hollow, about the young Edgar Allan Poe? And speaking of your movies, presumably about real people, what about My Neighbor Adolf, which may or may not be about Hitler in Brazil, and chess as well? Well, it is. um, My (laughs) Neighbor Adolf is exactly about, I play Polsky, a Polish Jew who survives the concentration camps and his, his family are wiped out in the gas chambers. And he flees after the war to South America and becomes a hermit, becomes reclusive and full of bitter hatred. Um, and he lives in the hills alone. There's an empty house next door. And one day a German moves in and he's convinced he's a Nazi. Well, he is a Nazi because he sees it in, in, what, in the people around him. He meets him one day and he recognizes his eyes. He met Adolf Hitler at a chess tournament many years before because the only reason my character survives uh, the concentration camps is that he was a chess master. So from then on, the story is about me trying to convince Mossad and the rest and the authorities that this man is Hitler and he's living next door to me. It's a cross between grumpy old men and rear window. Um, and my co-star is the, the wonderful, gorgeous man, Udo Kier, yeah. uh, who's, who's just a dreamboat. And we shot it in Colombia before the original lockdown. And it's coming out later on. Well, it's playing festivals later on in the year. And what about Raven's Hollow? Uh, Raven's Hollow we shot in Latvia, and that was great fun. I played Dr. Garrett. Um, Again, another (laughs) lovely, lovely soul who just fell in with the wrong crowd. (laughs) (laughs) Because he really does have a heart of gold. (laughs) Yes, it's about Edgar Allan Poe when he was training to be an army cadet. And he comes across a whole series of bodies strung up on crosses where they've been, where the where innards have been mm. ripped out or they're spilling from them. Oh. And he ends up in a village called Raven's Hollow when he tries to solve the killings. Mm. I hope it's going to be gruesome. I think it's going to be quite scary. <laughs> this good old, good old fashioned um, approach to storytelling. And it was great fun to do. And when you're part of horror movies or thrillers, what do you do to get out of character and leave it all behind and just return to normal when you go home? I walk off the set. <laughs> Literally, you have to leave it behind. You don't take the emotion behind with you. You don't to take uh, the anger with you. You don't take any of that with you. You take the mental work that has to be done. But it's, certainly as far as I'm concerned, I leave the emotional side well behind. I never take that home with me. I switch off the minute I come out of co- offset and out of costume, woof, I'm out of there. Mm. And what's going on there right now with the war in Europe and the fuel and food crisis there in the UK and elsewhere? Oh, it's a horror story. I never thought I would see in my lifetime, you know, another war tank rolling across Central Europe. It, it's horrific to all our eyes. But the outpouring of, I mean, I run a small humanitarian organization called Spirit Aid. And I've never seen some, you know, we exist on the help from the public financial support they give us. Um, but I've, the outpouring of support for the people of Ukraine has just been extraordinary. People opening up their homes and saying, I will take refugees. I will take them from, from, from Ukraine, taking whole families in. Uh, but the, the British government have been very, very difficult because the Home Office don't want them in. So they're making it extremely difficult for the Ukrainians to, to officially apply to take up the homes they've been offered here. But the humanitarian disaster is just horrific, absolutely horrific. But my worry is, we four weeks ago, we were, the world was concentrating on Afghanistan, that horrific humanitarian tragedy that's happening there with millions and millions of people facing abject poverty and starvation, and suddenly... The world's attention moves on to Ukraine. We've forgotten about Afghanistan. We've forgotten about the countries in Africa that have been devastated by these storms created by the, you know, the, the climate emergency we're creating. And what about the- yes? Through my charity, we've been delivering hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of food over the last two years to desperate families. They get a bag of food mm-hmm. for a family of four for two weeks. Mm-hmm. That the need for that has gone up. 
We've, we've managed to do a deal with the energy companies to reduce people's energy costs because you can't give people food if they have no means to heat it or cook it. Um, people are genuinely getting desperate. And it ain't over yet. The, the, the worst effects of Brexit have still to hit. Um, at least we're coming into summer, thank God. So, you know, it won't be as drastic as in the bleak, bleak midwinter. But it's going to be very, very tough for people. Next winter is going to be very harsh. Mm. But that's nothing compared to having to flee your home because yeah. it's being bombed and stratified from the air with missiles. You take your children and you, you take what belongings you can carry and you leave your culture and your language and everything, going, your job, your existence, your your studies, your dreams, and flee to another country, not knowing what the hell is going to happen to you. Who's going to look after you? That's desperation. So no matter how hard it may be for us with rising energy costs and all the rest of it, we're still safe. We're still warm. We're still in our homes. You know. And any last word about horror on screen and bull? It's a great 90-minute visceral ride. Uh, you, you'll be challenged. You will be excited. Uh, you'll see some terrific acting. It's a, it's a wonderful script. Um, the cinematography is terrific. It's a wonderful example of low-budget British gangster movies. And you will see... And in the lead man, um, Neil, turning in a superb, superb performance, as do all the cast. Great fun. Young people tend to love it. They bust, and the screenings I've been at, the young people just burst into applause. And they laugh as well throughout the film. It can be very funny. Uh, black humour. The older generation may, have a, may be a little challenged. <laughs> and when David Heyman looks in the mirror, what does he see? Oh, good Lord, I don't look in the mirror, please. <laughs> I gave up that I gave that up years ago, and even when I'm in the makeup trailer getting made up in the morning, I do my meditation. I just close uh, my eyes and meditate, and they do whatever they wish to me. And it's, it's, it's my oh, it's my mindfulness. Lovely start to the day. So I re- try uh, to avoid looking at mirrors. Yeah. Okay, thank you, David Heyman, for calling in. My pleasure. Thank you, Prairie. Oh. Be lucky and stay safe. Bye bye. And Bull has just opened in theaters and in release online. And next on the show, Bro on the Global Television Beat, with a spring preview of what to watch or not. Arts Express Paris correspondent Professor Dennis Bro just attended the series Mania in Lille, France, the largest TV festival in the world, where a meeting of capitalist conglomerates maneuver economically and politically about what entertainment gets released globally and what tends to take a back seat artistically. Referencing invasions, mergers, monopolizations, a cross between Agatha Christie and Columbo, a planet with no sense of humor, and the Rupert Murdoch of right wing French TV. This is Bro on the Global Television Beat, Breaking Glass. Today's episode Another European Invasion, Corporate Streamers and Spring Television Preview. The largest television festival in the world, Series Mania at Lille in northern France, where 40% of all French television series are shot, just ended. Although everyone paid homage to the invasion in Ukraine, what was also often unstated was how to deal with another invasion, that of the U.S. streamer conglomerates, as money is now pouring into Europe, where production values are cheaper and where local production is being driven by the global and Western success of the Korean series Squid Game, proving that audiences around the world are now no longer adverse to watching native language series with subtitles. Public television is everywhere threatened by these private monopolies. Typical is the case of Sally Riley, who heads the drama desk of ABC Television in Australia, where she is also in charge of an indigenous branch of the network. ABC has commissioned the Aborigine series Mystery Road and Tropu, the latter set in the alligator wilds of Queensland, as well as the detective series Jack Irish, all of which are critical of the power structure of Australian society. Riley complains that, with the global streamers now invading the market, it's much harder to secure projects, talents, and crew, and generally harder for public television to compete. Whereas previous festivals, even last summer's, Sounded a warning against European state production being overwhelmed, the panels at this year's Series Mania Forum tended to instead be lauding the way the streamers have invested in production, with the difference between cooperation and co-optation perhaps being thin. 
Bruno Pettino, the president of Arte, a German-French station that is the crown jewel of European public television, lauded the Arte co-production with Netflix, The World of Tomorrow, a supposed origin story of how hip-hop culture came to France. The series won the grand prize of the festival, but paled behind the vastly superior Disney Plus series, Osakin, about the police killing of an Algerian student. The lone voice of dissent on Pettino's panel, collaborating across borders, was the Italian Gina Nieri, whose company has ambitions of being the Netflix of Southern Europe and who still viewed the American streamers as a threat to European cultural sovereignty. At the festival, Warner Media, HBO Now, revealed it was investing $1 million in the Series Mania Institute to train scriptwriters, directors, producers, and broadcasters. This comes on the heel of Amazon's announcement of a £10 million investment in UK film and television training. Likewise, another panel featured Frank Spotnitz of The X-Files and The Man in the High Castle pleading and sometimes hectoring the audience of producers and media biz staffers to accept the American concept of the showrunner, not because it gave more freedom to the writer, since showrunners are writers, but because it was a more efficient way of rolling series off the industrial ramp and better suited to the influx of cash that was now arriving in Europe. In my book, Birth of the Binge, I lauded the ascension of the showrunner as giving new power to writers, with scripted series taking precedence over a god-awful era of unscripted reality TV. But in this latest iteration, the showrunner is simply a more efficient cog in the machine. This invasion has also prompted increasing monopolization and mergers of local TV stations in order to compete. Foremost among them is the proposed merger of France's two top private and linear broadcast stations, TF1 and M6. The fear is that Vincent Ballore's M6 will swallow TF1, which does commission its own French series in contrast to M6, known for its cheaply made reality series. Media magnate Ballore has positioned himself as the Rupert Murdoch of French media with his CNews cable channel, which spawned far-right presidential candidate Eric Zemmour being the French equivalent of Fox News. The mergers, as in the U.S. and as mergers everywhere, are resulting in media workers losing their jobs, to the point where Variety cheerily described a rosy media employment picture in the U.S. in the wake of a host of mergers, where in the first two months of 2022, there were only 200 job cuts. In terms of production overdrive, the leader in this field is Korea Studio Dragon, whose CEO, Young Kyu Kim, revealed to open mouths and gasps from the audience that his studio, which produced two series highly rated on Netflix, Kingdom and Crash Landing on You, was churning out a full series every two weeks. Kim also brought along a reel illustrating how Korea had ingeniously surmounted the country's COVID travel restrictions in a series about Korean and Italian mafias called Vincenzo supposedly partially shot in Italy, but in fact using a green screen background for actors and then filling in the Italian scenes with lifelike digital recreations. The play's the thing. As for the series themselves, the festival functions as a kind of global spring series preview with a host of socially minded series on the agenda. Clearly the best series at the festival, though the jury didn't think so, was the MGM epic streamer Billy the Kid, premiering on April 25th. The series starts out as the most cliché-ridden of all westerns, with Billy, spurs a jangling, and pistols at the ready, walking into an almost pitch-black saloon and facing down a bounty hunter who's after him. The opening, though, is simply a diversion, as the series then cuts to the tenements of New York City as the now pre-adolescent Billy and his Irish family decide to go west because the conditions of immigrant life in New York are so awful. The show then becomes a kind of Heaven's Gate, an underrated Michael Cimino film about the prejudice against Eastern European immigrants in Wyoming. The tension in this first season centers around a nativist hatred for all those not American, featuring killing and lynching of Mexicans, as well as a cabal of those in power who simply want to exploit immigrant labor. Billy's stepfather is, when Billy's mother encounters him, a racist debtor trading on his white privilege who must leave Santa Fe for the wilds of Silver City in order to flee his creditors. Just as another famous white bigot, who then became president, had to flee his debtors in Atlantic City for the wilds of Vegas and network TV. In the guise of a Western, Billy the Kid is a sharply critical examination of the American character. From Columbia comes Turbia 
a dystopic anthology series set in Cali, the site of much current labor organizing and dissent, about a drought in the not-too-distant future that accentuates the already massive gap between rich and poor, with the police barricaded rich now having abundant water, while for the poor, water is rationed or sold on an underground market. The series joins those other harbingers of impending doom as Joe Biden threatens the world with nuclear annihilation and calling for regime change in Russia, Snowpiercer, and The Walking Dead. The latter currently enjoying its finest season as the survivors battle a neoliberal U.S.-style government called the Commonwealth. The ingenious arc of Turbia has each director constructing their own episode within the drought situation, with the first three episodes concerning respectively star-crossed lovers on either side of the divide, an old man attempting to hold on to his shack being annihilated as part of a city demolition, and children threatened by a fascist army officer. The different age groups recalls Vittorio De Sica's neorealist trilogy with young, shoeshine, middle-aged, bicycle thief, and old Umberto D. subjected to the ravages of post-war Italy. The team of The Wire, David Simon and George Pelagonos, are back with a limited HBO series, again dealing with Baltimore, this time with police corruption in We Own This City, premiering April 25th. The series takes pains to show how police brutality is institutionalized, opening with the main corrupt cop, Wayne Jenkins, in an actual case from 2017, explaining to a group of his fellow cops that when you hit the streets, you forget everything you're taught in the academy because this is Baltimore. And if officers don't play rough, we lose the streets. We then flash back to 2003, where Jenkins is told this by the officer training him, and then forward two years, where he imparts the same knowledge to his trainee. The plot of cops stealing from those they see as merely the criminal element also figures prominently, and perhaps more ingeniously, in season two of the Noirdic Noir from Sweden, Before We Die. Two French dark policiers took quite different paths. Syndrome E moves at a frantic pace and encompasses a global medical conspiracy that also plays out in Morocco and Canada. While Our Season, or Off Season, is a French-Swiss series that breaks the traditional French cop series mode, an antiquated cross between Agatha Christie plots and Columbo-like eccentric main characters, in an appalling way. The female cop covers up a death, potentially a murder caused by her son of an Eastern European immigrant woman and asks us to sympathize with the agonized mother in a way that simply romanticizes the police violence and cover-ups that are otherwise contested in contemporary series as the Black Lives Matter protests begin slightly to affect police procedurals. The World of Tomorrow operates on the flimsy concept that rap and hip-hop culture arrived in France thanks to a blonde French DJ who went to a rap party in San Francisco and then transported the music. This series seems to have no feel for how rap challenged the very structure of a racist society, instead substituting the almost straw man figurehead of Jean-Marie Le Pen as its too easy target. Much better was Osakine, Disney Plus's first French series, which revolves around the 86 police cover-up of the death of an Algerian student. The series features a scene of police interrogation of the brother of the student, not to shed more light on the victim, but to figure out how to portray the death as either warranted or an accident. A flashback also recalls the 61 murder of up to perhaps 300 Algerians in Paris being thrown off the Pont Neuf, a bridge in the center of Paris, witnessed by the Osakine family upon their arrival in France. Who would have thought the Disney series would be hard-hitting? Well, the French series was pure fluff. Elsewhere, Gold Panning, the first Chinese series in the festival, set in the mid-80s in a Wild West San Francisco-type gold rush in a remote corner of the country where foremen cheat downtrodden workers doing the panning and everyone is out for themselves, trying to siphon off what gold they can. The series, with its contesting of the 80s greed is good ethos, can be read as a corrective on the Deng Xiaoping era of capitalizing Chinese society in the era of Xi Jinping's move to the left as he attempts to curb corruption and discipline too big to fail Chinese tech enterprises. The Dark Heart, now available on Roku and a prize winner at the festival that deserved that title, is a Swedish series about a controlling father who ravages the land and exerts his iron will over the town, where he's the leading landowner, his daughter, forbidding her romance with a worker's son, whose father describes the family as serfs to this capitalist lord, and the environment, as he refuses to update his logging techniques to the more sustainable solutions his daughter proposes. Finally, a series which suggests a social significance while actually staying purely in the realm of grimy science fiction is the Showtime remake of the David Bowie vehicle, The Man Who Fell to Earth. Outside of the heroines explaining that the reason she is coming along for the ride to aid an alien 
is to gain money to help her father who has lost his insurance and is dying because of this loss. There's almost no social context. The series attempts to be a cross between Nicholas Rose, the man who fell to earth, and John Sayles' brother from another planet. But all that is retained from the Sayles film, the better of the two, is the griminess. We don't know much about the planet the alien comes from, except that on this planet, there's no sense of humor. It has to be the least funny planet in the universe. And this is Bro on the Global Television Beat, Breaking Glass. Thank you, Dennis Bro. And now on the show, from the world's first cell-based meatball, which costs $18,000 per pound, to a different meat-eating future. And why would anyone want to eat it? We want to separate the animal from meat-making. The division cycle of the cell rather than the reproductive cycle of the animal. And this is a huge, huge paradigm shift. These small tissue samples will produce extremely large amounts of meat. From the consumer perspective, we're facing a brave new world. Technology that was once the stuff of science fiction now becoming a reality. There's a lot of fear around the intersection of food and technology. The manufacturers of lab-grown products should be required to invest in their own market and not ride the coattails of beef's success. Right now is a make-or-break moment for clean meat. That is meat. Hi, this is Jack Shalom. Imagine a world where meat is produced from animal cells rather than a slaughterhouse. Dr. Uma Valetti, the co-founder and CEO of Upside Foods, claims such a world is now within reach. A fascinating new film documentary, Meet the Future, that's meat spelt M-E-A-T, follows Dr. Valetti over a five-year period as he attempts to make his dream a reality. From the world's first cell-based meatball, which cost $18,000 per pound, to the establishment of a growing industry, Meet the Future presents a different kind of meat-eating future. I'm happy to have as our guest today Meet the Future's director, Liz Marshall. Hi, Liz. Hi there. Nice to be here. Thank you. Liz, how did you get involved with this project, and how familiar with the subject were you before you took this on? So it goes back to 2016, and I I was actively seeking an unfolding, solution-focused, character-driven story. (laughs) Okay. Just to give a bit of context, I'm a Canadian filmmaker. This is my fourth feature-length documentary, and, and I'm very interested in social issues. So for me, the journey began in 2016 when I was doing research. I wanted to focus on something that, you know, was able to illustrate over time, because it took five years to make the film, something that is underway, that could be a game changing uh, solution to many of the of the current issues and emergencies that we're facing in the world today. Well, Let's go to the heart of the film. What exactly is it that Upside Foods calls clean meat? And why would anyone want to eat it? Yeah, so the story begins with a company called Memphis Meats. That was their original name. And it was a startup company on the outskirts of the Bay Area in California. Teeny tiny team taking on this enormous challenge which is to innovate the production of real meat from animal cells, as opposed to, you know, the need to breed, raise and slaughter animals. This food innovation referred to now as cultivated meat is really the food technology, in a sense, of growing meat and harvesting meat outside of an animal in a clean, sterile environment. So so I guess I have to ask, if I'm a meat eater, do I want to eat this? Wouldn't a true meat eater think they want the real thing dripping with blood? And will they trust meat that doesn't come from a butcher? I think that's the big question. 
And I think because this innovation is still in its research and development and early production phase, I think that the next phase, obviously, will be, can it scale up? Is it scalable? Mm -hmm. Um, Can it be accessible and affordable to the masses, as opposed to it being, you know, a niche product? And so I think that is the next hurdle for this industry and meet the future of the film, you know, chronicles over five years, the birth of this industry through this one startup company that rapidly accelerates over that period of time, which was wonderful for the film to witness the birth of an industry that could potentially change the world. So whether consumers will embrace this en masse or not, it's early to know that. But if meat eaters actually knew the truth of where their meat comes from, you know, from a health perspective, from an animal, animal welfare perspective, and from an environmental perspective, I think people would want to either stop eating meat altogether or know that there are alternatives available so that they can continue to eat meat. Well, I, I've, I've got to ask you, agreed with everything you've said, but is this a solution in search of a problem? Why bother with it when there are already so many meat substitutes? I mean, the, the Impossible Burger from Burger King and so on, very good plant-based alternatives, I'm, I'm told, in terms of taste. And So if you're holding out for the real thing, then why wouldn't you just buy the real thing? And if you don't eat meat, there, there are shelves full of grocery products that you can buy nowadays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know it's a great question. By 2050, there will be nearly 10 billion people on our planet, and meat consumption is on the rise and is expected to double by that time. So with the demand uh, for animal protein growing, we need sustainable solutions, and we need them now. This food innovation is not utopian aspiration. It's viable. It's actually happening. People are tasting it. It's being produced. Singapore has regulated this. It's available for consumers in Singapore. In America, the FDA and the USDA is uh, working through a process um, to regulate it and bring it to market. There's over 100 startups globally now that are innovating cultivated meat, fish, and seafood so it's re- and the meat industry itself as you saw in the film is invested they've invested in mm. this industry so i don't think it's a question of squeamishness or anything like that i think it's a question of the paradigm shift is underway and it's still early days but in terms of this being a a film about the genesis phase of something truly pioneering It's very exciting to have created something that can stand the test of time in that regard. Let's back up just a little bit. And the the film focuses on Dr. Uma Valetti. How and why did Dr. Uma Valetti come up with this idea? And he, he mentions the roots of his idea came from his childhood in India. Could you explain more about that? Um, I was immediately, when I met him in 2016, I was immediately intrigued by his vision, but also I felt that I could trust him because I I could see that he was taking uh, sort of the world upon his shoulders. He was born and raised in India, and his first dream was to come to America and train as a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic, which he did as a young man. But then in 2015, he took a very, very risky career turn, and he became an entrepreneur, and he co-founded Memphis Meats, the startup company. And then it was in 2016 that he and his co-founder, Nicholas Genovese, a scientist, unveiled to the world the world's first meatball made from cow cells. It had a media spotlight on it. And that's when I became aware of it. And that's when I met him, was shortly after they unveiled that meatball. I was really intrigued uh, by his journey and his story and the risk and challenge of, of it. It was just a year after we started filming 
that the story took a major twist and turn. And that was when Cargill and Tyson and Bill Gates and Richard Branson and a whole bunch of other global investors supported his company. And he just suddenly, the company, you know, started to accelerate and the idea and the, and the innovation and the, and the industry was, was well underway at that point. I guess I was going to bring this up later, but I'll bring it up now. You mentioned Bill Gates and Cargill and even Tyson Foods. They made this this decision to accept meat industry investors. And I understand that when you have a dream, you try and raise money. But isn't this, in some sense, making a deal with the devil? I mean, what what were the practical and ideological reasons for that? Isn't this going to dilute their environmental messaging and brand. I mean, Cargill is is one of the great large conglomerates of agriculture. I, do you really think that people want our food supply determined by billionaires? Yeah, no, I think it's a great, great question. I think that Uma is sort of a master. He has become like a master diplomat in that path that he's walking and his methodology and his approach to all of this has been to, uh, in his language, build a large tent. So he wants to work with all stakeholders. And we see that unfolding in the film. And we see it manifested in the birth of this industry worldwide. And digging deeper into that, I think the logic behind that is that if you don't have these major conglomerate food empires behind you, that you will not ultimately transform that food system at all. There's also the the question of how we treat animals, animal cruelty. It's known that more than 70 billion land animals annually and globally are slaughtered within the meat industry. What's not talked about is that cultivated meat could actually help prevent future health pandemics and decrease foodborne illness and bacterial pathogens. It could also help minimize antibiotic resistance as a result of conventional animal agriculture. When you asked earlier, why can't we all go plant-based when there's enough sort of meat alternatives out there? Um, I know, you know, for myself, I'm vegan. I don't eat animals at oh, all. Oh, interesting. Uh-huh. Um, for ethical reasons. And so it's not really for vegans. It's not, although I'm sure vegans will eat it. This is for meat eaters. Meat eaters are still the vast majority in the world. And meat consumption is on the rise. So we need we need solutions. I'm interested that you say that you're vegan. Well, I guess I can just say, frankly, I mean, the next agricultural revolution, as this is touted, just to me seems unlikely to come from Bill Gates, uh, the, the largest single owner of farmland in the US. I mean, Bill Gates is committed to preserving Bill Gates and his dominance over everything. I mean, mm. I, I, it, to me, it's like having the Pentagon underwrite a world peace concert or something. I mean, yeah. you kind of he's kind of let the camel's you know, into the tent. Uh, And this is no uh, disparagement of your film, which I think is really fascinating. But I just wonder if this was a really uh, bad decision that might that might have consequences that would undo Dr. Valetti's good intentions. Sure. So the cultivated meat industry is using the levers of capitalism to achieve an outcome that is intended to help transform a very destructive food system, a very flawed, globalized food system. And certainly there's lots of room for analysis and discussion about the ills of capitalism in its current form. And it is the current system that governs the market and transactions and production and consumption. And so my take on that is that the need and effort to transform capitalism and to, you know, change that system, I'm all for that 
to create a more equitable, fair, just, globalized, you know, reality for people and workers and the average person for the 99% on the planet. However, when it comes to this topic, which is the focus is industrial animal agriculture and the havoc that it is wreaking on the planet, we need immediate solutions. We need viable solutions. We need to change the system now. And that is underway, and that's what excites me about this topic and about this film, because I think changing the, the, the deeper roots of the problem at large, that will take more time, I think. Have you tasted the product? I and have. I've, I've tasted what's it. What's it like? So I tasted it twice as part of my research along the way. You know, it tasted exactly what I remember meat to taste like. I'm not the best person to ask because I'm not a meat eater, but it certainly had the the memory for me and the experience, the chew and the taste and the everything about it was meat. It tasted exactly like meat. The only difference is how it gets to the plate. And that's what's revolutionary about this. Yeah. Do you think we'll be seeing it on our grocery shelves soon? I hope so. Anything else you'd like to add, Liz? W- will you uh, try it? Uh, no, because I don't want to eat meat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> are, you, are you vegan? I'm not a vegan. In fact, I'm a pescatarian vegetarian. Okay. But so, uh, so not, there's, not meat. The film is released on demand in the U.S. and select territories around the world and as part of Earth Month. Thanks so much, Liz Marshall, director of Meet the Future. This is Jack Shalom for Arts Express with host Prairie Miller. And that's all we have time for today on Arts Express, expression in the arts. And if you'd like to express yourself too, you can write to us at theradiogoddess at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Prairie Miller leaving the station.